I am obnoxious to each carping tongue who says my hand a needle better fits. A poet's pen all scorn I should thus wrong, for such despite they cast on female wits. If what I do prove well, it won't advance. They'll say it's stolen, or else it was by chance. I first read those words in my freshman year American literature before 1900s class, my first semester here at Denison. To say they inspired and astounded me would be a massive understatement. They were written by poet Anne Bradstreet, the woman now remembered as America's first poet. I knew for a long time that sexism had existed in history and that it had affected publication and women's acceptance into publication, but I had never heard it so blatantly called out by a woman writer who had lived through that sexist time. And as a woman, as a writer who was coming in as a creative writing major, and as just a general nerd about books and history, I was so excited by this. I was even more excited and surprised by the fact that Bradstreet was far from the only woman we studied in that class. In fact, that syllabi in total was made up of about 15 men and eight women, meaning about a third of the writers that we were reading were women. Next, please. Now, this was surprising to me for a couple of different reasons. The main one being that this had been very different to my previous experience with classic American literature. In my own high school and middle school experience, that curricula had looked something like this, largely limited to the white male authors that dominated my English syllabi from about seventh to twelfth grade. Now, at the time, I wasn't thinking super deeply about this quite yet, but I knew I always loved reading about women writers. I was inspired by them, I loved analyzing them and writing about their work, but I had also learned not to expect to have the opportunity to do that too often in my classes. And I assumed, at first, that this was because that sexism I mentioned was just so potent that few women had managed to be published. Well, once I took this class, and once I realized that so many more women writers were out there, I was absolutely hooked. And as anyone who knows me can tell you, when I get really invested in something, I tend to go down a lot of Google search internet rabbit holes. Anybody else do that? Okay, thank you, I'm not alone. Um, but um, yeah, this time it was really nice because it wasn't just me sitting in my bedroom on my laptop just, just doing this on my own. I actually had the perfect context and I was very lucky to have the perfect context to do this in because I was also taking an intersectionality focused writing 101 class my freshman year. And my professor in that class, Professor Kelly Jo Fulkerson Dekua, could not have been more supportive and could not have been a better mentor for this project. Next, please. And she was so supportive of my curiosity about these women writers, about all those endless rabbit holes I went down, and the endless rants that she never acted like she was tired of that I did both in my assignments and verbally after class. She was very, very wonderful about the whole thing. And all of that research, with her support, ultimately culminated in my 15-page final paper for that class. Now, in this paper, I did a couple of different things. I traced the levels of subtlety and radicalism in women's work throughout history. So, for example, if a woman wanted to say something radical or challenge a societal norm, I traced the techniques of subtlety that she would have used, or that she did use and I was picking up on in her work, uh, to just kind of temper those radical ideas, to make sure they were still making their point, but that they were readable and digestible for a very sexist audience, because other otherwise they might risk not being published at all. I then connected those sexist circumstances that made that subtlety necessary to our contemporary literary society, because I found echoes of that when I started moving into research that was more contemporary in nature. And what I found was that this historical sexism particularly played a role in one major literary institution in particular that you heard from the intro, the American literary canon. Next, please. 
So the American literary canon, a lot of you might be familiar with, and as you heard from the beginning of the speech, it's essentially a collection of all the works and writers throughout American history that have been deemed worthy of study and are most frequently and widely taught in US classrooms. Now, as you can imagine, being part of the canon is a particularly powerful position to be in. These writers have essentially had their voices immortalized in this vast body of literature, and they're taught to students all over the country years and years after their death and semester after semester. This is just what we're ingrained with. And as you might be able to imagine, this is a big problem when the voices that are dominating such a powerful body of literature are white men's voices. And uh, several scholars that I did, in, that I did research uh, on for my paper have made the same point. Next slide, please. But one thing I also heard in my research and one assumption that I made when I was in high school is that women just, again, weren't able to gain access to publishing. And that's why there were so few of them um, when I was in middle and, middle and high school. I could not be more grateful to that class, my first ever English college class, for teaching me that that was absolutely false. I learned from all of my research that there were so many accomplished women writers throughout history that we just weren't reading. Next slide, please. Their work spanned generations and genres. They were award winners. They had done so much for our society. There were women like Laura Redden Searing, a poet who was told she couldn't possibly know anything about poetry or writing or rhythm because she happened to be deaf. Next slide, please. There were people like Nellie Bly, who faked insanity and got herself committed to a corrupt mental hospital to expose the inhumane treatment of patients there and bring much needed reforms. There were people like Nella Larson, an accomplished short story writer who went on to become the first African-American woman to win a Guggenheim Fellowship. And there were people like Wakako Yamuchi, an accomplished award-winning playwright who started her writing career working on a paper in an internment camp where she was imprisoned with her family during World War II. Next slide, please. But as you can see, just because the past eras were so undeniably sexist and tried to bar women from publishing and made it so difficult, that doesn't mean that none achieved publication. And just because those eras so systematically prioritized men's voices and made women fight to be read and understood doesn't mean that we have to do the same. Moreover, I believe that we have a responsibility to do differently. We owe it to the writers who have been forgotten about and neglected for centuries. We owe it to the students like me who were so inspired by women's work and knowing that these women existed, but who had learned not to expect it too often in their classes. We owe it to the girls stuck in middle and high school classes where most of the writers they're told are important don't reflect who they are. And we owe it to ourselves, to our society, and all of its students who are currently being taught a literary canon that represents only a tiny sliver of the diversity present in both our contemporary world and past historical eras. Now, I wish I could tell you that there was a cure-all for this sexism in the canon, that we could just snap our fingers and the canon would be diversified. Unfortunately, of course, there is no such thing, that's impossible. The fact is that this is a structure that is centuries in the making, carrying over from that legacy of historical sexism. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. And once I learned that this was the reality, I knew I wanted to do something. Again, not fix everything, but at least take a step in the right direction. That's why for my five week summer research project, the summer after my freshman year, I created Missing Pages. Next. Missing Pages is a free online database and resource for educators and other curious readers dedicated to the preservation of women's voices in literature and their further integration into the American literary canon. 
Now, broken down, what that exactly means is that on this website, I've documented about 70 women and non-binary writers from American history, from four centuries, five genres, six historically underrepresented groups, and about 25 states and territories. And I'm always adding new people to the database, so work in progress for sure. Next, please. On this database, as you can see from the drop-down menus, all of our writers are organized by time period, genre, and historically marginalized group. And this is a structure that's designed to make it very quick and easy to navigate through the database to find exactly what you're looking for, whether you're a curious student who has particular interests, or if you're an educator who needs to be able to find content for your classes, because we all know, uh, if we've been through the school system and have, and have paid attention, that um, educators are busy. <laughs> like, they have a lot on their plates, and they're so, their schedules are so ex exceedingly full, they don't have time to do all of this research themselves. So I wanted to make this very easily accessible and navigable for all users of the site. Next slide, please. Under each author's respective time period section, you'll also find a profile of them. So this will include a picture, their name, other categories they can be found under on the site, a brief summary of their life and achievements, which let me tell you was very hard to fit into a paragraph because they've done so much truly. Um, and also a what did she write about section that will tell you topics they commonly wrote about and a where can I find their work section, which will give you links to where you can access or purchase their work. When possible, I linked to free databases when the author's work was public domain and there's no copyright. But if there was copyright or if you just want a physical copy, there's also links to online bookstores you can purchase it from. Next slide, please. You can access this database by scanning the QR code on the screen or visiting www missingpageslit.com. And I hope this will help you out there. I hope that you can share it with people who might be interested because again, what I said is true. I can't fix any of this by myself. No one can fix any of this by themselves because there's no one solution and it's a huge problem. But my hope is that this database can serve as a resource for education and information and can help people spark those conversations in their own communities about bringing more women writers into the classrooms. And again, I'm not saying we should completely gut the existing American literary canon and like get rid of all the men. Actually, don't do that, please. Um, but um, I am saying we can do so much better in increasing the diversity of the canon, bringing in writers that we haven't been hearing in, into the mix. And that, I believe, can enable us to create a more diverse, more inclusive, and more complete, and frankly, historically accurate picture of literature and literary history. And I believe it can make a world of difference for these writers and for our students and our society if we care enough and we're willing to put in the effort. I hope this database can help with that in some small way. Thank you very much.